So let's do the, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Um, it's great that you all decided to join us this morning to talk about uh, the legal and policy ramifications of this consideration of a UN uh, cybercrime treaty. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves. I'm Megan Stiefel. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at a nonprofit called the Institute for Security and Technology. Hi there. I'm Charlie Snyder, and I'm Head of Security Policy at Google. Hi, everyone. I'm Jane Lee. I'm Senior Counsel at the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section at the Department of Justice and part of the U.S. delegation to the negotiations. Hi, and I'm John Herring. I'm a Government Affairs Manager on Microsoft's Digital Diplomacy Team. So, um, of course, you all know that, that cybercrime is an international problem. Um, and we're, we wanted to do a, a number of things with this panel, but also in particular think about how we can break down what's going on so in a digestible manner. So we have a great group of um, panelists who can talk to you about both the government and uh, bilateral, multilateral ramifications of this, but also the ramifications for companies who are involved uh, and can be impacted by these negotiations. So um, to get a better sense of the landscape here, we have the expert, Jane, all of the experts, but particularly Jane, to give us a sense of where we're at with this, um, what the existing instruments are that govern international uh, engagement around cybercrime and why it is that we're having a conversation in the first place about a new treaty. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I want to, first of all, thank you all for joining this conversation. I'm very grateful to be able to participate and hear from my fellow panelists and all of the audience members here and I look forward to learning from the insights um, during this conversation. So I appreciate the um, participation, being able to participate on the panel. Uh, just to give a little bit of background in case you haven't been following the cybercrime treaty negotiations, um, the United States is currently working with a broad group of countries around the world um, to draft a UN cybercrime treaty. And our objective in that process is a focused criminal justice, justice instrument uh, which is aimed at improving the investigation and prosecution of cybercrime. Um, we want that treaty to be firmly grounded in the commitment to human rights, fundamental freedoms, and rule of law. Uh, and since the start of the process, the United States has really underscored the importance of an open, inclusive, and transparent process. We want all member states to be engaged in the process. We want multi-stakeholders to be involved in the process. And we want the dialogue to be um, open and inclusive and transparent in how we're drafting this treaty. Um, and we hope that uh, uh, member states will work in good faith toward a consensus-based instrument. And that's something that I'll emphasize over and over um, during the panel discussions, I'm sure, because consensus is really uh, what we believe will make this a uh, helpful and um, a productive instrument. We want wide accession to the treaty once it's concluded. And we think part of that is in engagement, lots of engagement, transparency. Um, and that's why I'll emphasize the consensus-based treaty, um, I'm sure, multiple times in my, in my responses. But in terms of where we are in this negotiation process, uh, our US delegation just returned from two weeks, just returned this past weekend, so apologies for any jet lag. Um, we just returned this past weekend from two weeks at the fifth negotiating session in Vienna, Austria. Um, and during that session, member states and multi-stakeholders had the opportunity to share their ideas and proposals on the topics of international cooperation, technical assistance, prevention, implementation, preamble, and final provisions. Then in the prior session, which was in January of this year, which was also in Vienna, member states and stakeholders shared their ideas on criminalization, procedural measures in law enforcement, and general provisions. So based on all of the past proposals and comments from member states, the chair and the secretariat of the ad hoc committee, and the ad hoc committee is the committee that's currently working on negotiating the cybercrime treaty. So the chair and the secretary will produce a zero draft of the treaty text in mid-June. So the current date that we have for that is approximately June 20th. And that is an important date because that's when we will have text from which to start negotiations. So up until this point, we've been sharing ideas, proposals, opposing proposals. But at that point, on or about June 20th, is when we'll have the zero draft of the text treaty. Uh, and so that will be the basis for our upcoming session, the sixth negotiating session in August in New York. Thanks, Jane. Um, I don't know how many of you all are lawyers, and so some of you may be looking, wondering a little bit about something called an ad hoc committee and, and nation states and, and multi-stakeholderism. So hopefully everyone is familiar with what multi-stakeholderism is. But in case you're not, um, at the UN it's governments talking to governments. Um, and in negotiating processes it's not usually the case that other stakeholders, industry, civil society, academia, um, have a seat at the table. So 
at the when I was working on these issues uh, in my old time in the government, we um, that was the early days of, of the multi-stakeholder process, which is a process that includes not just governments but the other stakeholders, represented by the rest of us over here at, um, on the panel, to ha to ensure that particularly when it comes to uh, digital ICTs, information and communications technologies, which in most cases are operated by the private sector, uh, that the private sector uh, and the civil society organizations that advocate for um, the safe and secure use of these ICTs uh, have an input in, and are accounted for in the negotiation process. That it's not just government saying to each other uh, and basically dictating how uh, essentially the private sector will carry out its, its ongoing work um, in operating information and communications technologies. So this ad hoc process is the way that in which this multi-stakeholder engagement is happening. Um, and Jane, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about sort of starting uh, once the zero draft uh, begins. Um, the ad hoc process will probably continue, I think. We'll get into this later on when we get into the closing uh, section, but, um, and I'm jumping ahead of it, so don't yes. hate me, but. No, no, um, I can certainly. Uh, I think it's important for folks to know that, that why it is that we're, um, why it is that we have an ad hoc process, because it, it is really essential, I think, to ensure that, um, particularly for those of us who think we need an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable uh, ICT information, information ecosystem, um, that, that all stakeholders have a way to engage the process. So um, speaking of all stakeholders engaging the process, this is now where I turn it over to, to uh, Charlie and John to talk a little bit about um, what the stakes are for you all here um, and, and uh, what the treaty might look like um, as it relates to the existing instruments, and we didn't actually talk about the ex existing instruments, so maybe we should do that first. Okay. Um, I'm happy to start with that discussion of existing instruments. Um, it's an important question because as the U.S. is engaged in this process, we've been very concerned about how this treaty will fit into the current landscape of existing instruments. These existing instruments are working and already effective in combating and investigating and working together on um, cybercrime issues. So we don't want to start from scratch and we don't need to. That's why this question is important and that's why the U.S. has been concerned about how this new treaty will fit into that landscape. And it's not just the U.S. that's been concerned about how it will fit into the landscape. It was also called out specifically in the U.N. General Assembly resolution calling for the creation of this ad hoc committee. In that resolution, it specifically called for taking into full consideration existing international instruments and efforts at the national, regional, and international levels. We don't want this instrument to undermine existing tools and channels for cooperation that exist. Uh, so speaking of the existing instruments, the important ones, the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. You may be familiar with this. It has 68 country uh, parties from around the world and 20 additional countries that have either signed or been invited to accede to that convention. And that Budapest um, instrument outlines core cybercrime offenses and processes, uh, excuse me, and provides for procedural powers to secure electronic evidence. Uh, Budapest also serves as a legal basis for international cooperation. And even aside from these 68 party countries and the 20 additional con um, countries that have either signed or been invited to accede, many more countries around the world have used Budapest as a model for their own domestic legislation <coughs> to criminalize cybercrime offenses and for the basis for procedural authorities to investigate and prosecute uh, cybercrime within their own national legal frameworks. Um, the, another instrument that's important right now is the um, UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, or UNTOC. That instrument has proven to be extremely useful because that instrument is targeted at core types of organized criminal activity while also including broad international cooperation provisions that can be applied to any type of serious crime committed for profit by three or more persons. So as a result, many, many parties to UNTOC have already used it successfully thousands of times, uh, including to combat crimes like ransomware and child sexual exploitation. 24-7 um, network points of contact are important tools that exist right now to preserve evidence preserving evidence, you know, not only for uh, cybercrime cases for all, but for many types of criminal investigations is really critical. Um, in addition, there are bilateral agreements that facilitate international cooperation between countries. So we know these tools exist. We don't want the new treaty to undermine any of these effective existing efforts. And one of the ways that we're working to ensure that doesn't happen is by uh, drawing important concepts and language from these instruments. So by doing that, you know, we avoid con causing uh, conflicts with these existing effective instruments, and also we think it's a good way to build consensus among countries that have already signed on to these other instruments. 
Um, we recognize the fact that any final cybercrime treaty that we um, uh, negotiate in this context in the ad hoc committee will have to work alongside of these existing instruments. Thanks, Jane. So just to, to add a little bit additional color, so for the one that I'm the most familiar with and I think that, that has perhaps um, uh, contributed to the, this, the need for this treaty or the, the uh, yes, We'll say, that. we'll say it that way, um, is the Budapest Convention. And under the, under the Budapest Convention, uh, that's how, in many cases, governments exchange information and obtain information from providers within their jurisdiction to, uh, at the request of another government, share that information to the other government to investigate a crime. Um, so it could be a hacking crime, it could be um, basically any uh, crime where there needs to be information obtained from Microsoft, Google, AWS, as examples in the United States. Um, the Budapest country members, as Jane mentioned, 68, but there are a number of others. This existing process has provided for decades of, of um, productive and collaborative work um, and has uh, brought, I think, um, and matured in a way that's been uh, very effective. Um, but now we have uh, this new oncoming dialogue. So Charlie and, and John, could you share a little bit about sort of how you all are thinking about this treaty conversation given that we have been leveraging uh, the existing instruments and, and what, um, what the new treaty might have, as I, the question I posed a minute ago, <laughs> uh, how that might support or disrupt the, um, the current process. Sure, I'll start. Um, so first of all, I, I think as uh, Megan alluded to, uh, you know, companies, technology providers, particularly when you're talking about you know, cyber dependent crimes, but for, for crimes in general, we play a very important role in the ecosystem in, in facilitating law enforcement investigations. Uh, by, by responding to requests for data, information about accounts, et cetera. Um, so that's why we're involved and we're very passionate in, in getting this right. And I think industry and governments around the world uh, are very aligned in uh, the need to expedite and to strengthen tools to pursue uh, serious uh, cyber dependent crimes. I think what we're watching, I, I think there's kind of two ways to look at this, you know, two, uh, you know, reasons we care and we think others should care, and the first is, is kind of values-based, and the other reason is more about the practicalities of, of law enforcement and, and investigations. So, you know, the first is, when you look at the scope of what this treaty would be, I think all options are, are on the table right now. Um, and so cybercrime, I think to a lot of people in, in this audience, we would view it as uh, cyber dependent crimes, crimes that are fundamentally uh, about the use or misuse of computers. So think of things like hacking, ransomware, et cetera. There's an alternative view uh, that cyber crime is, is uh, you know, any activity that has to do with crime online. And I think as we all know, you know, this is why we're here. In the modern world, basically every aspect of life uh, touches digital technology in some way. So should this uh, treaty be about hacking and ransomware and, and serious online threats like that? Or should it be about a much broader spectrum, uh, including things that aren't commonly accepted uh, as crimes all over the world? Um, you know, different countries have obviously different, different legal traditions and different things they would consider crimes. So we're closely watching that piece. And because of that, um, I, you know, we have a vested interest in making sure uh, that law enforcement requests can be uh, handled expeditiously um, and one of the biggest challenges in, in doing so is conflict of law. And with these different legal instruments uh, in conflict, every request we get, we need to evaluate that it's a lawful request, that it respects human rights and things like that. Um, if this treaty complicates that picture, uh, it's going to be counterproductive. It's going to be harder for, uh, for governments to get the access that they want to get from technology providers um, because it's going to take us longer to evaluate and make sure that it's not uh, you know, a, a request isn't in conflict with, you know, other legal regimes. Um, so those are the things we're watching. Yeah, kind of co-signing everything uh, Charlie just spoke to uh, there. It, it's a little bit difficult to kind of determine what the exact stakes are um, until we see a sort of draft treaty that Jane alluded to that we'll hopefully see in June. You know, at this point, all we've seen are sort of consolidated drafts of proposals. Uh, from various countries which run the gamut from, you know, quite reasonable based on existing instruments to quite absurd. Um, so I'm on a mission to alarm a little bit and to encourage greater awareness and engagement um, because I do think there is potential for this to be you know, quite a troubling development if it kind of goes in the wrong direction. Um, and you know, to my mind, it, it focuses on, on two things in particular, scope, which Charlie referred to, and then also the, the processes involved. You know, what 
is cybercrime and how can we keep that narrowly tailored to what we've traditionally understood to be those cyber dependent crimes. Um, and then also what are gonna be the processes included in this treaty um, to, to enable uh, law enforcement cooperation here. There's, you know, that, that includes everything from how long data might need to be retained by companies uh, to, you know, how is, how is the request for that data taking place? Um, there have been proposals to have that not have to be uh, with the inclusion of the, of the government where the uh, company is, is located. Um, so there's a lot of troubling uh, potential scenarios here on the other side. Obviously, any treaty negotiated at the UN uh, or anywhere is only gonna be governing over the countries that sign on to it. So there's sort of some silver lining there that even in a worst case scenario, maybe it just doesn't get a lot of traction. Um, but even then, as we've been sort of discussing here, if it conflicts with existing instruments, um, like the Budapest Convention, most notably, you know, all of a sudden then, as an international technology company, you're in a bifurcated world um, where you at least have two fairly incompatible, uh, you know, international legal processes in place, um, and, and one of which may be uh, quite misaligned with the values um, of, of, of your company, and certainly the values that are reflected in the Budapest Convention, and that have been uh, you know, core to, to cooperation on cybercrime for, for 20 years now. At least there. Yes, well, I share your alarm. Um, so again, that's part of why we wanted to talk to you all this morning. So we're grateful that you're here so you can share the alarm bells um, far and wide. Um, so thinking about kind of the, the, the macro here down to um, the micro around kind of individuals and groups specifically that, that are we're most worried about in these negotiations as kind of the most vulnerable, um, what would it mean to include appropriate protections for them in the agreement itself? Who wants to start? <laughs> I'm happy to keep going. <laughs> keep going, John. I sure. Think you're on a roll. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the, to kind of bring everybody back to the, the beginnings of this process, this is not a, uh, a negotiation that was kicked off by a bunch of countries that are party to the Budapest Convention. You know, this is a process that was kicked off by countries that seem to be a bit revisionist, um, and I think there are some concerns that it could cater to authoritarian and undemocratic interests um, when it comes to you know, policing the, our digital environment. Um, and so to that end, I think there's good reason to be concerned that this could include um, you know, uh, jeopardizing uh, political activists, dissidents uh, abroad, um, and, and then also you know, security researchers, white hat hackers, you know, people who have been kind of core to the cybersecurity framework for a while. Yeah, um, we talked a little bit about different types of crimes um, and, and the, the need for the focus of this particular instrument to be cyber-dependent crimes. Uh, Charlie mentioned that, that not all countries have similar criminal laws. So in the United States, we have the First Amendment that protects our right to say bad things about the government. Um, in some countries, doing so, uh, we often call these less majest laws, um, say you can be prosecuted for saying bad things about your government. So those are the types of things that that's an, I think hopefully a better, uh, not a better, another example of the types of, of um, uh, branches that this process could take. And so uh, also thinking about, uh, John mentioned white hat hackers, um, not wanting uh, there to be criminalization of, of standard cybersecurity practices like pen testing and the like. Also, I think our, our, we'll get into this a little bit, I think things that we don't as, as uh, uh, common, uh, you know, like-minded uh, folks here um, share concerns about not wanting to see this treaty kind of tread, tread toward those um, areas. Um, in terms of the, the industry obligations, and so we, backing up a minute, we said, right, countries make requests to each other through their central authorities, usually in departments of, of justice, uh, to obtain information from a provider within the jurisdiction. Um, that is, can be, and, and I think one of the reasons we're having this conversation about a treaty is because some governments have said, uh, provided very little evidence uh, to the central authority to obtain information from a, a country, excuse me, a company in its jurisdiction. Um, and as a result, that uh, can complicate the process, that can slow down the process. And so some of the governments who have advocated for this new treaty uh, are doing so because they believe the process is too slow. Um, but uh, part of the reason is for, for what uh, John and Charlie have said, right? The, the, co the companies need to follow their own uh, jurisdictional requirements and, and ensure that the request meets the lawful requirements of the place in which they are re resident, um, which is an obligation on the companies. Um, are there particular industry obligations that might result differently, sort of throwing a wrench in the process for this longstanding exchange of, of information between central authorities and, and providers? Yeah, I, I mean, it's important to note, like this treaty would not uh, uh, relieve companies of 
the legal uh, obligations we already have, whether it's you know, Cloud Act or, or any other uh, you know, laws we operate under. And so the, the value to us of the treaty is, is streamlining these things and putting us all on a common baseline that lets us evaluate these requests really quickly. Um, but they can only do so if that baseline includes uh, important things that will allow us to have uh, more comfort as we're evaluating requests. So for instance, things like uh, due process requirements. You know, countries need to commit to meeting certain due process bars. You know, things like, you know, think of, uh, you know, subpoenas or even just, you know, commitment to the rule of law, uh, human rights safeguards that give us comfort when we're evaluating a request um, that we're not gonna be in conflict with existing, you know, laws we have to operate under. And just to give you a, a sense of the, the scope and how difficult this is, uh, we release transparency reports on how many of these requests we get. And uh, our last one covered six months in 2022. We received 175,000 requests uh, covering over 400,000 accounts. And, and again, we have to evaluate all of these to make sure that these are, these are lawful uh, requests for data. Um, and so if the treaty is not able to uh, get us to this common baseline where we can quickly evaluate requests and don't need to deeply investigate them to make sure that they aren't in furtherance of human rights abuses and things like that, um, it's actually going to have a, a, a perverse consequence. It's gonna make these, these requests uh, take longer and be more difficult to get through, um, ultimately kind of defeating the purpose of the treaty to begin with. And, and picking up on that, I think just you know, some things we think of that might help some of those concerns um, that you could try and bake into the treaty, including things like you know, robust protections uh, for human rights included, you know, throughout um, and, and very robustly up, up front. Um, and, and then also being clear about what the ideal process for requesting uh, data is. Uh, there's, I think this, there's a lot of education that has to go on through this, this process. And there's, uh, I think, a, a certain understanding in a lot of, uh, of a lot of countries that you should just be going to that service provider to get access to data. Well, that's not how you access data in, in you know, any other domain. Um, and ideally, you'd go right to the data custodian first. The person has the most proximate access and responsibility for that data before you would then seek access from a service provider. So things like that could help streamline things a bit, um, which would be good. Uh, and then finally, making sure that the treaty is intended to and expressly uh, says that it's designed to uh, address serious offenses, um, you know, things that would you know, result in, in prison time that would, would you know, constitute a, a serious offense. So just to jump in on one point, um, I just wanted to clarify one thing, which is that the mechanisms of cooperation under this treaty, they're not gonna replace other existing mechanisms. So if you're cooperating under another existing treaty, you may have certain obligations there. We don't want those obligations, we don't want there to be conflict um, with the obligations then that we're fashioning for this treaty. That's, that goes back to the original point of how does this exist in the landscape of other existing instruments. So when we say streamlining, I just wanted to make that point clear that it's not necessarily that other means of cooperation will be um, eliminated through this treaty. Other avenues will exist. We just don't want the channels that, you know, that we have in this treaty to conflict with those other channels. So if you can get evidence under you know, that treaty under these circumstances, but here, if you decide to use this treaty, you, know, you may be able to bypass some of the safeguards those are the conflicts that we're trying to avoid. And um, you know, one of the important points that John emphasized here was the protection of uh, human rights and due process. And so for the types of crimes that we're talking about where there might be authoritarian regimes uh, working to see greater control over information and speech, you know, something that the United States is uh, carefully watching as we um, look at the zero draft and the upcoming negotiations is ensuring that there's adequate protection of those human rights and fundamental freedoms because um, that is ultimately one of our key priorities um, to ensure in this instrument. So we, we sort of alluded to complications potentially on the cybersecurity side of things, but um, I think this was really a question for Charlie and, and John in the first instance. Are there risks posed by these treaty negotiations to the way in which uh, some of these companies in the room uh, and you all um, uh, conduct your cybersecurity services? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, John mentioned security researchers. Uh, I think as a lot of people in this room know, you know, laws around the world uh, can cause complications for security researchers who are acting in good faith uh, and helping companies uh, find vulnerabilities so companies can address them uh, before, before attackers find and exploit them. Um, even in the United States, uh, you, you know, our, our legal regime 
uh, isn't, you know, just by law is not entirely clear, and that's why the Department of Justice, I think, has, has helpfully uh, released guidelines uh, uh, over the last couple of years, stating that if you're acting in good faith uh, to support cybersecurity, um, we're not going to prosecute you under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, but the, the wording in the, in the treaty related to these types of, of crimes of you know, unauthorized access to computers and essentially computer hacking, um, there are concerns that that could be picked up and if, um, if it is not uh, worded properly, and indeed there are differences of opinion between uh, various countries here uh, about the value of security research, um, this could uh, result in kind of a step back from all that positive progress that's been made, not only in the United States, but different countries in, uh, around the world, and in Europe in particular, in clarifying that, that good faith security research should be, should be protected. And you know, for Google, this is a huge deal for us. I, I think we you know, paid out $12 million last year to security researchers who've helped Google, helped our users, and, and any company that is in this business um, could see an erosion of, of the positive gains we've made where now countries would be able to, under uh, pursuant to the treaty, uh, you know, pursue these good faith researchers uh, who play such a vital role in our ecosystem, um, but who could kind of slip between the cracks of these laws and be treated the same way a malicious hacker would be treated. Um, so that, that's something definitely to watch for, for all the cybersecurity people. Yeah, it's a, it's a real shame, and, and it seems like it could even be, you know, um, an unintended consequence where you're encouraging a, a, a malicious market because you're making it harder to be a, a responsible yeah. actor. You know, I think this gets back to just, you know, how can we clarify the intended purpose of the treaty? How can we um, limit the scope to be focused on serious crime? Um, things along those lines can start to, to, to help protect those communities. Um, and then also, you know, a big part of this has been talking to a, just a much broader span of countries as these negotiations have, have gone on. And so it's also bringing folks up to speed to say, hey, this is why you would want to make sure you've protected this community. Um, and so that's been an important part of the conversation. Just, just to give an idea, idea of kind of like the, the scope here and the changes that this could lead to, I, you know, there's a whole list of potential offenses that could be included in the treaty. Most of these countries do not have laws uh, relating to a lot of these things. They may not have a computer hacking law, and they're going to be adopting it, uh, you know, based in part on, on how it's written in the treaty. Um, so if you get the right idea in there and the right framework, it could result in you know, great outcomes for security researchers around the world. If you get it wrong, again, it's going to be a huge step back. So in terms of the, the, the promise, right, the, the, to go back to our title here, um, and apologies that this slide was, I didn't update it when Jane joined us. So um, she's from DOJ, and we have someone here from, uh, at least one person from state here as well. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're, we're still talking about the promises here. We, we'll come back to the promises. So uh, this is question, obviously, is for Jane. Um, from a government perspective, are there things that U.S. and partner countries would like to see out of these negotiations that could improve um, efficiencies or otherwise support a more robust response to cybercrime? Yes. Um, the U.S., um, at, at the core of these negotiations, is seeking a focused, narrowly tailored criminal justice instrument. I think a lot of the things that the panelists have been talking about now about all the different types of crimes that may be, promote, uh, may be um, proposed um, to be included in the treaty go far beyond just a narrowly tailored criminal justice instrument. So the U.S. is, that is our objective um, in terms of the proper scope for, for the treaty. And we think that in terms of promise that there could be efficiencies and um, benefits to come out of this treaty. Um, so for example, uh, you know, we hope that the, the, the UN treaty may enable cooperation for certain countries that don't have other means of cooperation um, to combat cybercrime. And we also hope that this treaty can serve as another basis, something that does not conflict with existing tools to build capacity and to um, provide needed technical assistance to member states and better enable them to prevent and to investigate and to combat cybercrime. Um, and so I think these are potential benefits from the treaty, but as the other pan panelists have mentioned, you know, the proper scope for the treaty, the fact that you know, terms are well-defined in the treaty, that we know what type of conduct is criminalized, clarity about those things are all very important for the U.S. as we negotiate, and particularly as we start to negotiate text. 
yeah, hey, if the, if the treaty comes out, or the draft treaty comes out in June, and it's just copy-paste a Budapest convention, like, I owe you all an hour of your life back. Um, because, like, there's certainly a way that this can, like, move things in the right direction. Um, if we can, you know, harmonize uh, laws and, and international cooperation instruments in line with um, things that are uh, rights-respecting and that are addressing, you know, the real challenge of growing international cybercrime. Um, that would be good um, if we could leverage the treaty as a you know, piece of, of infrastructure to support capacity building, um, not with forced technology transfers, but on a voluntary basis to include industry. That would be good. Um, if it could, you know, um, in, in an ideal world, start to address some of the safe havens that currently exist um, by bringing countries on board to a legal regime uh, where those safe havens are um, and, and supporting extradition. That would be great. Um, I, I think there's a lot of good that could come here uh, but I, I worry that it would look like a copy-paste of Budapest with some updated terminology, maybe. Um, and that doesn't seem like where things are, are currently headed. So in terms of um, what's, uh, what's coming next, so I, and just so folks know, we're going to do questions in a, at, at the bottom of the hour. So we'll have about 10 minutes or so. So in about seven minutes, if be thinking about your questions, because it's a great, it's a great group. Um, we just, I feel like, Hopefully you all are coming away with the peril, right? This is about peril. Um, yeah. <laughs> back promise. to the alarm bells. Um, so where are we at? You know, kind of what, how, how do we avoid the peril, or how can we kind of prevent the peril in, in the most constructive ways? I think um, there's, generally speaking, I think a, a good deal of agreement on kind of what could, what good could come, what risks there are. Um, how do we, how do we move forward um, as we approach the final rounds of, of kind of the negotiation before the zero draft um, and and how can folks here but also uh, you know obviously Microsoft and Google and and their peers will continue to engage the process but how will that look for the next couple of months I can start with yeah. maybe a um, sort of key dates and then others can jump in with um, how you can contribute um, so first we expect the zero draft treaty to come out around June 20th. And then there will be a stakeholder consultation during the intercessional period. What, the interse what we mean by intercessional period is the, set, the period between the formal negotiating sessions. So between, um, so sometime around June 20th through the 21st in Vienna, um, we think that there will be scheduled a stakeholder consultation. And that session will likely consider the zero draft. So if you're interested in following along and participating, that is an important intercessional meeting to, um, to be engaged in. Then the next negotiating session will be August 21st through September 1st. And that will be the, the negotiating session where we look at the text of the zero draft. And then following the August negotiation, one final negotiation session is scheduled to take place in January of 2024, where the draft treaty text is finalized and approved. Um, and then following the committees, the ad hoc committee's adopted roadmap, the treaty will then go before the UN General Assembly for consideration and adoption by August 2024. So it's a very short timeline, but those are the, uh, the key dates, um, upcoming key dates over the next couple of months, few months. Thanks, Jane. So this is actually, um, is there a way that this all goes sideways and, and there is no agreement? Um, and I think the related question is, um, you know, if, if we don't reach consensus uh, by this August 2024 timeline, is it like what happens in the United States where legislation goes away and has to be reintroduced in the next Congress? Or um, maybe we don't know because this is not something we've undertaken before? Um, in terms of the kind of sequencing and, and uh, technicalities of the, these negotiations, what will, what will happen uh, if, or sort of what's the, in some cases, maybe the best case scenario. I won't ask you to say that it's the best case, but um, how might we avoid this? Is there a way that we might avoid this, technically? So the US is optimistic at this point that we were headed um, toward a consensus-based instrument. Um, we have not seen the text treaty yet, but that will come out in June. What we see there will be very important. And we think that we're working with a broad group of member countries um, toward our uh, shared objective for this treaty. They understand the perils as well. And so we're working together across a broad range of countries. And once we start negotiating text, I think you know, that will be a, a pivotal moment. So at this point, you know, we're still optimistic yeah. that we can reach a consensus-based treaty, um, but also being very aware of the, our key objectives and also the perils that we've highlighted here so far. 
Yeah, and, and Megan, I think you first asked, you know, how can we uh, maximize the, the promise and, and minimize the peril? I think um, one, one thing that's been a kind of bright spot here is that it has been such a collaborative process. I think not many, uh, you know, intergovernmental functions uh, have mechanisms to allow input from civil society, private sector, et cetera. Um, and, and this process has, I think, in a really positive way. Um, and Jane mentioned intercessionals and, and seeking uh, stakeholder input. Um, you know, I hear there's uh, a lot of vendors at RSA. Um, if you have, you know, data on traffic, threats, know things about users, like your company could easily be impacted uh, by this treaty, and uh, they are running a process where, where uh, governments want to hear from you uh, on the impact that this could have. And I think the best way that we can ensure a good outcome is by having these, uh, these important groups, whether it's civil society, academia, think tanks, as well as industry players, um, you know, providing their, their perspective into the mix to make sure that we get something out of this that, that works for everybody. Yeah, I, I might just add to that. I mean, uh, I think in terms of maximizing the promise, uh, it, it's about winning votes at this point, um, where it will be, you know, as, as the process moves forward. And uh, to, to Jane and the DOJ and the State Department's enormous credit, um, I think they've, A, been phenomenally consultative um, with the, the private sector and, and broader multi-stakeholder community, um, but then also just so much engagement with that broad coalition of countries. And, of course, that includes those 68 states that are already on board with, with, with Budapest, and then obviously like the multitude of other states who are just at very different levels um, of, of development as it relates to you know, cybercrime and, and being prepared to, to combat that. And, and it's a, not an easy conversation. You know, when you want to say, hey, the cybercrime treaty should not be focused on you know, violent extremism or it doesn't need to include these content restrictions, well, if you're a country that's navigating those challenges, they can seem very proximate, and why shouldn't that be in the cybercrime treaty? Um, and I think those are difficult conversations that have been happening um, and have found a lot of, of, of good headway. Um, and so credit to all of you guys for, for doing that work. And I think it, it's incumbent on you know, all of us who are adjacent to um, this process by virtue of working in this industry to, to support those dialogues as well. So just on, on a sort of an administrative point, um, you mentioned, Jane, that there are like two, two windows this summer to keep participating or to join the conversation, but what's been the most of kind of effective way that, that you've um, consulted? Has it been the in-person in meetings like this, the written, uh, written contributions or direct participation in, in the ad hoc? You know, do you have to be there to participate or can, are there other ways that folks can join the conversation? I mean, there are several different ways. Um, we've seen really a robust model of stakeholder participation um, emerge through this AHC um, process, as others have talked about. The modalities themselves for this ad hoc committee were very forward-leaning. Um, an application process for both stakeholders already accredited through the UN Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, um, and stakeholders without that status, which saw more than 200 stakeholders without prior UN ECOSOC accreditation um, and dedicated stakeholder consultations ahead of each negotiating session. So the engagement has been, has been robust, but we encourage more. Um, so to take full uh, advantage of those modalities, we encourage those who have accreditation to participate directly. Um, we realize that direct participation is a big time commitment and resources for you all, and you have other responsibilities, but it provides a really unique opportunity to be heard by a really wide number of member states and countries. And I know that, you know, it's just um, the companies that are represented here, they've been involved directly, and other countries, not just the U.S. delegation, but other delegations have also engaged with them directly on, you know, sideline meetings and um, dialogue. And I think that's been helpful for um, really en enriching the conversation that happens during the member state discussions also. So um, that's definitely been a, a benefit to in in-person consultations. Um, and in terms of best informing the United States and other countries of positions, your positions, written input with specific edits or changes to the draft negotiating document, um, looking ahead to the zero draft treaty. That's a very concrete and quite useful way to uh, pass on your comments and thoughts. Um, and that, you know, that said, we applaud all of your efforts to be engaged and um, encourage you to be in, as engaged as, as you can. Terrific, speaking of engagement, this is your turn. Um, questions are, are welcome. Um, I will kind of moderate the questions. Um, so hopefully I won't have to though. And I know Tim Stark's gonna be very kind. Um, please, I'm probably Tim. gonna be annoying and not kind. I'm, I'm not, not kind either. Um, I'm, there's a process part of this that's confusing to me. You, we, you keep talking about consensus-based instrument. 
is there, does there come a point where in the negotiations you say we're going to have a vote, there needs to be unanimity? What's the, I don't understand how things advance from where they are at, to the point of a vote before the United Nations fully. That's for June, probably. <laughs> sure. Um, so the reason that we emphasize consensus is at the end of the day, whatever the instrument is, we want wide accession, right? So if there's not consensus and it's driven by a vote of a few or by a minority, you know, that's not gonna, ultimately not gonna be an effective instrument. In terms of processes for this um, particular treaty negotiation process, uh, there are, if consensus cannot be reached, and it's determined that consensus cannot be reached, uh, there are some steps that would then lead to votes, which John alluded to earlier. But at the end of the day, we don't think it's in anyone's interest for it to go to votes because an instru international instrument, really, it's only as effective as how much participation you have. If you're talking about the international cooperation, you know, a, an instrument that doesn't have widespread accession, it's not gonna be a valuable instrument at the end of the day. So that's why we're encouraging and really optimistic about the consensus process, but in terms of sort of the technical logistics of it, um, written into sort of the fine print of the, of the committee, if, if it's determined that consensus cannot be reached and there's a process sort of uh, going with the chair and then um, uh, other bodies, important bodies as well, then votes can um, play into the picture. But um, at this point, we haven't seen the treaty text yet and we're optimistic that um, countries are still focused on a consensus driven approach. Thanks, I think we'll go over here and then we'll come back over here. Thank you, Megan. Um, Khaled Fatal, uh, this is a media question, and I'm, I'm sorry I had to come to this microphone. Now you're going to be watching a tennis uh, match <laughs> moving back and forth. Um, you asked, Megan, you asked a question earlier on that I wanted to ask, but I'm, uh, what I'll do is I'll follow up on it. I'm, I'm certain you guys want to see the peril eliminated and the process accelerated as well. The challenge that I, s that I find is if we focus on the word peril, and by the way, I have been... I've been involved in global infrastructure of the internet since the mid-90s, and I have actually attended UN events at the invitation of Secretary General Kofi Annan and the first consultation of the internet uh, to, that created internet governance uh, back in 2004. I have seen how the, the uh, negotiation on text goes. So if you think you're trying to save us an hour, my God, I can save you years. <laughs> it's challenging. And the reason I'm asking this, the question I want to pose to you is, um, not only do we need a UN a, a cyber crime treaty, I believe we need a, a, a cyber treaty because the risk from cyber attacks and everybody's so involved and the devastation they create, that has to be uh, curtailed somehow. My question to you here is step away from the role you do for the companies or the organizations you do and if you had your way to uh, turbo boost the process so we can get not only to cyber crime, cre crime treaty, but to a cyber treaty. What was it? What is it that you can do? Well, that's a tricky one um, because that's I. That's why know it's, that, it's a yeah, challenging yeah. question. Yeah. Well. Um, this is to the I, whole panel, to the panelists. I think. I, 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 well, no. I, I started this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would just say, you know, it's ex it's really important that this cyber crime treaty remain focused on cyber crime. I mean, that we feel very strongly that this should not be bleeding into broader conversations around cybersecurity um, and, and state behavior online or, or things more broadly. And I think our, our, you know, going back to our original sort of points at the outset here is that the scope, I think, is what's going to be the most critical piece of this to make sure it doesn't bleed beyond that. So there certainly is an important conversation to be had around expectations for responsible behavior by all stakeholders online. Uh, that takes place in a different UN committee um, it takes place in a working group that I think feels fairly stymied at the moment in very complex geopolitical times. Uh, but I think conversations around peace and stability online are, are meaningfully distinct and should stay distinct from a cybercrime conversation. Yeah. Other question? Hi. Uh, you just kind of touched on this, but I'll, I'll ask, I'll dig in a little bit more. Um, I've been uh, reliably informed that uh, countries read each other's mail um, and um, that. Uh, Different uh, uh, potential uh, countries signing onto this um, might uh, run into issues of um, hamstringing their own uh, cyber espionage efforts. Um, and 
kind of going back to what, what you were just saying, like, and, and with regards to the scoping of this, um, is there, uh, I guess, is there like a definitive line between like cyber crime meant to stop cyber criminals versus cyber crime meant to stop or kind of cutting out cyber espionage uh, uh, from the negotiations? Or is that, I guess, what are your thoughts on that? I, I, again, I think there are meaningfully distinct uh, categories at this point. I think the, the content of the cyber crime treaty, and Jane, yeah. correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, is gonna be focused on more traditional criminal activity, and we certainly hope it will be focused on that. You know, questions about what is the boundaries of acceptable government espionage, um, I, I think have remained gray and thorny for a while and, and likely will continue to do so. So not really the scope of, the converse, of, of this particular treaty. It's sort of, it's the elephant in the room that is not going to get, hopefully, um, <laughs> will not see its feet on the paper um, <laughs> or its trunk or tail or anything else, I think. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so question. Um, on media as well, um, I was wondering, so countries do not have absolute control over the actions of the hackers that they work with, of course. And so we, my team at NBC broke a story in December about the involvement of a Chinese state-affiliated threat actor in the theft of government benefits. The question at the highest levels from all of our sources was like, we have no idea to what degree China is aware or not aware or directing this. So how do you, in context of those struggles around attribution and the links of hackers to the state, avoid this becoming a peril of escalation from a geopolitical perspective? I mean, I, I think similar to the to the gentleman's question that was just answered. I, I think the I think we feel that the treaty should be limited to more traditional uh, computer crimes. There are separate statutes for things like espionage um, that I think you know we you know if governments can figure figure out how to how to handle you know international espionage things. I, I best of luck. Um, but uh, limiting it to more traditional computer crimes, uh, I think, kind of sidesteps that question in the same, you know, in the same way as the previous question. I think that's that's my view. Yeah, and I'll just add, I uh, echo that completely. So, in in your example, it would be, how does the country then prosecute, or, or the prosecutors in that country prosecute the criminal actors? Right. Um, and if they don't have capacity, if it's a country that doesn't have um, cyber crime laws, then how can this treaty help? Um, uh, help guide them in terms of what kinds of laws to implement domestically, and then what kinds of procedural authorities um, are required to investigate uh, the crimes and prosecute the crimes, and how to cooperate internationally on getting the evidence they need to prosecute the crimes. So I think in that example, it would be the prosecution, the more traditional criminal prosecution of actors, um, separate from um, state actors and, and um, uh, sort of a, a, the separate topic. Um, you, you have the last question. question. <laughs> uh, my question relates to who can submit such requests, you know, potential unintended perils. Um, there are countries, federal governments, where states have different uh, definition of what's the crime. Something that's the basic human right in one state is a criminal act in another one. Um, is this potential treaty looking at, you know, states submitting requests or can we prevent him that? Uh, can we prevent that? I mean, I think that is what's at stake here: is uh, you know ensuring that there are safeguards uh, for you know protection of human rights and due process. You know, things like uh, you know states should commit to you know things like independent judiciary and evidentiary requirements and things like that. In in when a law enforcement organization makes a request to to someone like us, um, and I think that those are the types of issues that are on the table here. And something that would go you know ways to to addressing that are, are um, you know expectations around dual criminality, and that's something that could be reflected in, in the treaty, so that you would have to have those those same expectations to to facilitate that. Thank you all. Um, thanks, Charlie, Jane, and John for for hopefully getting you all excited about this um, <laughs> in a good and scary way. So um, thanks very much. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks very much. Good job. Good job.